My name is Michael Todran, and um, thank you for having me um, on the second studio. I really like your guys' uh, podcast. So yeah, briefly, you were talking about that you're teaching during COVID, and that's been quite the experience. So um, it's a lot. It's hard. I will say that I've talked with other professors um, privately, and I've seen professors just practically um like literally crying about how difficult it is to be teaching at this time especially for something like architecture landscape architecture where it's traditionally studio based and you have trace paper and you could talk to them in person and uh all with all of that being removed it's a really big challenge yeah and at first my attempts at uh, at teaching this the classes uh, failed, I would say, in a spectacular fashion. <laughs> um, <laughs> what happened? What, what why? <laughs> just just I didn't know how to do it. I, I did some good stuff really early on. So uh, I'm teaching a planting a planting uh, identification or a planting design and ecology class. And uh, the last semester that I taught it pre-COVID, we would do a field trip every single class and we would meet at a different garden and we would sit down and we would draw the plants and have a, like a, a visceral experience with them and you could touch them and you could smell them mm -hmm. and you could talk about them. And for us, for landscape architects, the experience of being in a garden is is so important and when you removed all of that i'm like okay how <laughs> yeah, I, what, yeah what what do i do so the good thing about me being able to produce content video and audio is that what i did is i got gopros and i strapped it on the chest of uh plant experts and then i got another gopro and a gimbal and i followed them through gardens and we talked about it and those that was something really successful that we did really early on that i was very happy about but that only goes so far yeah right because they watch those videos and that's great but now how do you feel like the classroom time and a lot of the failed things that i tried was we tried to do lectures but i don't know if you've like lectures are brutal enough as they are <laughs> uh now imagine doing them over zoom right and like it's just doesn't it just doesn't work um so i i have uh three plant classes and i have four different tas uh two of two tas in one class and one in each one of the other ones and i emailed them and i just wrote help like i don't know what to do and so we had a powwow and we're like how do we fix this class and I, we need to do it in a hurry and so what we did was we set up games so that kind of engagement is really helpful where um there's like a cahoots website where they could set up like a timed quiz that's fun and has good graphics and it's like competitive mm -hmm. right and that worked out really well the students really like that one a lot and i could tell that they're learning um then we did a headbands game where like you know that game where you put like a card on your head and everyone yeah. has it Indian so poker. For us, yeah 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 exactly <laughs> Indian poker so we did a, a simulation of that we had to modify it for zoom but we figured that out and, um so the plant would be like you know am i <laughs> am i deciduous do i flower during spring like you know it's awesome and, um, it, yeah it's awesome like it's you know it, like so you really get to nerd out like that and then, of course, uh, concept board is really helpful. Yeah, hey, I've heard of this. Yeah, so definitely jump on that right away because it's very it, – actually, this is how much I love concept board. Even when we go back to uh, live studios, I'm still going to use concept board. Hmm. Like um, I think because everyone puts up their – their drawings and then you could zoom in and you could draw right on top of it you could get your um if you have like a surface pen or a tablet mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then you could just draw like it's 
it's the closest thing to paper. And in some ways, it's even better, right? Because you could save it instantly. You don't have a bunch of trace that you have to scan in. and um, But it's still like that organic experience. Interesting. Oh, there we go. An excuse for me to buy a new... It's interesting because, uh, like I was mentioning before the recording, you know, I'm teaching, but the program I'm a, I'm a part of right now <clears throat> is... Uh, is actually through Cal Poly Slow, um, mm-hmm. but uh, the, it's a study abroad, abroad in quotes, because it's, a, it's in San Francisco. Yeah. And so obviously a big part of the, and the program is still happening this year, right, come this January. Um, and, you know, it lasts for two quarters, but obviously a big part of that is the experience of San Francisco and students, oh, these are undergrad yeah. students, you know, learning what it's like to be in a city and learning about the city. So one thing that we've discussed is you know, one of the other professors, the director of the program does these long walking tours yep. where the students walk for like, you know, 50 miles a day or something ridiculous. <laughs> and he was like, well, you know, possibly what if I got myself like a lav mic recorder and then did the walk on my own and gave the tours as it would. And then students yeah. could later on listen to it and walk on their own in the streets, which is fairly safe, right? Masked yeah. up and kind of relive the experience, but not as a group. So we're thinking about workarounds, but um, you're definitely well, right that having some experience with producing content in the way that we do, very helpful. Yeah, I would say not possibly doing that. I would say you have to do that. Mm. You have to do that walking tour. Um, and I would say that the audio is not enough. Um, I would definitely um, – here, one second. Sure. Uh, let me show you something. You know, I have this gimbal for my phone. Ah, oh, very cool. Right? And this is like another thing that you get to buy, David. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you. I see what on, side you're on. We're on the same page I, for sure. I should get, I should get, uh, I get a cut it. off of this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that one's only like $110 or something like that. But definitely, um, uh, uh, the, like adding the video with the, with the, with the sound with a good quality sound and the video is really engaging. And I also decided to put my videos up on YouTube as opposed to the insular Mm -hmm. video that you could do with Cal Poly. Um, Cause I think that opening up to a broader audience is important. And then um, what I did is I made the students timestamp seven comments in regards to the video so in youtube if you just type in like one uh colon Mm -hmm. two five then it's a hot link and it just clicks right to 125 in the video and i make them timestamp seven comments for the video one is a way for me to checking that they actually watch the whole video but more importantly it's like i could just go to youtube and i could click and i could read their comment and I know exactly what they're referring to. And it's really powerful. I would say that's one of the most successful things that I did in regards to teaching online. Yeah, that's great, man. I, and the you beauty know, of, oh, go sorry, ahead. go ahead. I was just going to say, more broadly speaking, that the thing that I've started to realize, <clears throat> well, realize this when, when COVID happened, was that like the lines between like what we do on the show, um, both in terms of content, but in terms of format, and teaching and doing running a business like all of it's getting quite blurred like what's the mm. difference between because I le- like we were participating in a conference and we gave like a lecture but really because we're in front of computers a lecture is no difference than having a zoom meeting but just with two people and i don't really know the significance of that um but perhaps it's opening doors to like you know more alternative ways of doing things well i'll tell you what Nobody wants to fucking watch a recorded Zoom video. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Like it's 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 brutal. Like you know, like I'm talking about, like the, the Brady Bunch, like nine faces, and you're just sitting there and you're just like, ah, like, you know. So that's why that immersive. <laughs> I say that as we're recording a Zoom video to put online. <laughs> um, but, but you know what I mean by like a like a one person narrative or, or one person recorded lecture on Zoom. Yeah, yeah, um, of course, and it, it so, depends on the presenter. Like you're an interesting person, so yeah, I think people will tune in. 
you know. But the but but the but I mean we're having a dialogue, right? So that mm-hmm. might it, it definitely like increases the engagement, and of also we're paying attention to the sound quality, and we're going to sync it up, and it's just going to make it that much better. Um, but the video walkthroughs are really successful. Like it's really engaging as well, right? And um, I have another gimbal where uh, I put with this little GoPro and I, I walk through sites like that. And that's really effective because you get that that the wide. more fisheye wide. And then I'm such a nerd and I don't care what how people look at me. So I'll even put like, <laughs> uh, uh, a, a strap on me and, <laughs> and I'll walk through and like uh, you know and I also have a head strap one but um, but you know uh, you know David I wouldn't do that in front of Marina because she still has to look at you <laughs> with, <laughs> with some kind of respect so oh that's, uh, that's... Oh, that's long gone you know <laughs> that's long gone yeah 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 so if you're already there then yeah. feel free feel free to, to do that but um yeah, those types of things uh, I don't I don't mind doing to get to get content. And actually, we even um, employed like drones and and stuff like that for for creating our contact that content that we're really we're really proud of. Yeah. So actually, on that, um, you are producing right a video, or you can probably give an introduction, but you're producing a video about the L.A. River, or focused around Los Angeles. Sure. So. Um, Basically, um, what I'm doing, it, it's it's the next evolution, uh, in, I think, in me having a podcast. So if you guys don't know, I have a podcast called the Landscape Architecture Podcast, right? And um, basically, you know, I learned how to interview people, and then we started recording the video. And I guess the net, the next natural progression was to get into storytelling but as a filmmaker Hmm. and um, it's a really funny story about how all of this played out. So um, I interviewed Tomas Coolhouse, which is Rem Coolhouse's son. And he produced a, uh, a documentary on his father called Rem. Mm -hmm. And so uh, myself and Audrey Sato, who, you know, um, she was a guest on your, uh, podcast so her and i went to tomas's house and we interviewed him all about the process of making a movie a documentary in regards to architecture and i said i could do that right like the way that he explained it and uh i said okay this is what i want to do i want to make a documentary about landscape architecture and I didn't know how or what, um, but like it was an itch that I couldn't get rid of. Mm -hmm. And then my department head, Andy Wilcox said, um, uh, Hey, do you want to teach a filmmaking class? And I was like, absolutely. (laughs) And so instantly I had (laughs) a, a crew of like, you know, 16 people that I could help make this, this movie. And at first we were just going to do uh, just a series of interviews, like sit down, quarter frame, face, and good lighting. And and then we were going to stitch it all together, right? And then uh, Francis Aquino, who's a student of mine, said, do you know Professor uh, Kat Superfisky? And I said, no. And once I met her, I said, Okay, that's it. We're doing the whole documentary. We pivoted the whole entire class. Said we're doing the whole documentary on this woman and the work that she's doing um, in Los Angeles, and specifically the work that she's doing on the LA River. And um, we never looked back. And then now, like we finished the trailer. I don't know if you got a chance to look at the trailer. Mm-hmm. We, we did. did. Um, but yeah, if the audience wants to look at it, it's if you go to superfiskyfilm.com and that's Fisky, not with an R, not Frisky. <laughs> so it's superfiskyfilm.com. It's a fantastic you, name. <laughs> yeah, and that's and, and that's her that's her real name. That's so crazy. it used to be a really long Polish name and then it got cut down like like many immigrants did. Mm. 
to like simplify it and so it's like yeah it's the best subject matter and if i could share with you a really quick story yeah my favorite part about making the film so we were we did a lot of interviews with her at different parts of the la river and i knew that in order to make the movie complete like uh so i i I would probably relate myself to to like one of those eccentric artists like filmmaker type (laughs) guys you know what i mean uh and like i think people with personality personalities like mine when we have an idea of how we want something done it has to be done right like we just can't let that go and one of the things that i knew that i wanted was uh a helicopter shot from the beginning of the la river all the way to the end and that's 51 miles long right and Mm. you can't do that with a drone in one take it's just impossible and so i knew we needed a helicopter shot and of course we have no money and um I was like, okay, I'm going to do a fundraiser to get this shot. And uh, I was just about to release the fundraiser. And of course, I was going to use my podcast as a platform to advertise on that. And I'm sure we would have gotten the money. And right before we were about to release it, COVID hit. Mm. And, you know, architects and landscape architects, when COVID hit, we saw a lot of people have a lot of uncertainty about the future right we didn't know how this was going to play out and you know people like there was already talk of furloughs and stuff and i was like you know what i don't feel right asking my audience to donate on something if they don't even know if they're going to have a job in a month right and i saw this guy producing these amazing helicopter fly-throughs in los angeles uh post covid and what he was doing is he has his own helicopter and he was flying through la and showing how quiet the streets are i found him on instagram i dm'd him i gave him like a a super long story about how i'm a professor and we want this shot and this is the film that we're producing and he dm'd me back and he's like yeah i'll do it and i was like okay and uh I kind of got excited, but at the same time, I was like, no way is he going right, right. <laughs> to just shoot like this whole video sequence for me. I shit you not. Two weeks later, he sends me an email with a link to a Dropbox that has 4K video on a gimbal from the belly of the helicopter and the nose of the helicopter. And he started at the, at the beginning of the LA River shot it in magic hour so it's perfect la lighting and flew the whole entire (laughs) river and uploaded all of the the 4k video to dropbox and gave it to me for free oh my god yeah what did you say to him i mean that's like some i mean you know like power this guy right here like come on like look at this that's Uh, incredible i think i think i love that story because i think well, it did a couple things. Once, once the students saw that video and how we did it for free, and once we started putting together the clips, like the students, like really realized, like, wow, this is a, this is going to be a real documentary. This is not, uh, you know, those student films that people do, and and then it's just kind of like you, your mom, mm-hmm. and like a couple other people watch it, and that's right. it. Um, this is not the case. Like that's when they realize, like, wow, this is going to be a real documentary. Like that, we could submit to Sundance and we could submit to other film festivals. And um, the you know, um, it, it's it's something beyond just uh, something insular in in the landscape architecture community or even in the university. Like like. Um, Sorry, what was the what was the question? I don't know. <laughs> we know we're just we're just talking. I, I was kind of curious, uh, yeah. you know. So, but prior to this, did you have a lot of film making experience? Uh, a little bit depends on depends on who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, th- with my friends, like I have friends that are like. Um, uh, the, the short answer is no, uh, but. 
uh, more in depth is that um, I think going to art school and being an artist, I was an artist for 10 years is, um, and I was like, I come from like a really, a uh, very fortunate art school where they really focused on that when people ask you like what your medium is, right? They're like, are you a painter or are you a printmaker, a photographer, or filmmaker, right? My art school really push the concept of you use the medium that you need to tell your story hmm. right and then you learn that medium and you go for it right so for this story i had to learn how to be a filmmaker and i think the podcast definitely helped because people's biggest mistake when shooting an indie film is bad audio right. and really early on my friends that are in the production world will say people will tolerate bad video but nobody tolerates bad audio and that's where most people fail so me recognizing that right away and being able to capture good audio for the film really helped elevate it and then i it's going to sound crazy but i would say that my film school was that one interview with tomas coolhouse mm -hmm. like everything that he said if you go and listen to that interview, it basically you could save yourself sixty thousand dollars in in filmmaking school, <laughs> and um, and if you just apply what he says and and I'm so, oh, obviously I'm oversimplifying it, but um, yeah, I just went for it. So the answer is no, no filmmaking, but I just figured it out and made it work and asked a lot of questions, like talk to my friends and say, okay, what. What are the settings that I need for the camera? And uh, and I will say that I am a photographer. Um, okay. I, I shoot architecture uh, as a side hustle. And so understanding light uh, and ISO really helped. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you were stepping as a complete newbie. <laughs> Correct, of yes. Coco Plane. <laughs> yeah. So I applied, I applied the photography. It, I applied the photography and the audio recording and I kind of merged them together. Mm -hmm. And then, and then of course, like, um, like I applied everything that I learned as an artist. I, I, the reason why I'm so excited about super Fisky is that it, it, it's applied every single skill set that I've developed over the years into one project, like filmmaking, you have to know graphic design, you have to know filmmaking, you have to be a leader, you have to know how to still tell a story, you have mm -hmm. to know how to technical. Um, yeah, right. It's, it's, it's a thing. It's big. <laughs> <laughs> so what, where are you guys at with with that uh, film that you're doing with COVID happening? Are you still shooting? Are you no, done shooting? No, well, kind of, kind of. So basically we got most of all the film filming done. Um, uh, it's hard to quantify, like, I would, I would say, you know, maybe like 90% or 85% done filming. And then um, uh, what we're going to do is pick up like B-roll and some interview, some interviews with her parents to kind of like to talk about the, how Cat Superfisky became Cat Superfisky. Um, but right now what we do have is we have a really solid trailer and um and then we're gonna we're basically in the editing stages so we're gonna edit it as if we have all of the content mm -hmm. and then when we see like glaring gaps then we're gonna right. go get that gotcha right that footage yeah but um but this started off as what month are we i'm, I'm so lost in time i I'm, sometimes oh, i think yeah. it's the summer but it's it's fucking yeah. november it's california too so, so it's a bit confusing right? yeah so yeah. uh but this is um kind of like associated with a, a course so the students are still involved or is that from no the no previous? no uh, okay. the class is over okay right and so i'm 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 taking it i'm taking it over from from here gotcha um and I think there might be one or two students that just kind of fell in love with the project and are gonna just keep doing it just because of a uh, a passion project. And um, I reached out to, uh, or somehow I got 
in touch with Landscape Architecture magazine, which is obviously our trade, our biggest trade magazine mm-hmm. from ASLA. And uh, they're going to do a story on it in December's issue. So I think that's going to generate a lot of a lot of interest. And what we're trying to do is get pre-sales money so that way we could um, pay for a music composer, mm. which is around like $10,000. So I got to raise that. And then I also got to raise enough money for a powerful computer to edit it. Because yeah. my little Mac- yeah. Yeah, my little MacBook Air is like, <gasps> fuck you, dude. Like, don't ask me to edit 4K this movie. Four K. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, video production is something that we've. Um, I mean, we have we have cameras in the studio, but we've, mm-hmm. we've we've talked about and looked at looked into for more extensive things. Um, you know, filming outside and things like this, and what permits you need. Oh my gosh, it is. I mean, as you would expect with a, an industry like film, it is so complicated. The number yeah. of people, I mean, it depends on how you're doing it. If you're doing it legally and you have interviews and you're going to say, like the number of people you need to get some basic shots, you know, like um, we were looking at, uh, you know, comedians and cars getting coffee. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, hugely successful. And there's been a lot of people trying to copy that format. But I think for the viewers, you look at that and you say like, oh, <laughs> yeah. what does that take to do that? Uh, it takes a lot of expertise and there might not be a huge crew, but there's a crew. You know, yeah, and uh, it's it really um, it's an art form that I have a lot of appreciation for because it's so, uh, uh, you know, like you have to capture everything like in, in that particular moment to get it right. And there's post, but I mean, it really comes down to to executing in the moment. Unlike oh, in architecture where you you can you prep forever, and the construction takes a long time too, so you have all this time to kind of fix issues. Uh, filmmaking maybe less so <laughs> yeah i love that 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 like that inverse analogy that you just made between like filmmaking and architecture is definitely i i i don't know i've i've lived it i see the point that you're trying to make with that but um yeah comedians in cars is, is so successful because it is you know it, it is a simple concept right and then there's even another one with uh, I think Kevin Neely, the comedian from Saturday Night Live, mm-hmm. he gets a selfie stick and he points it at himself, and he takes other celebrities on a walk in like Topanga, <laughs> and that's it. That's the whole production is one one iPhone and two lavaliers or two um, microphones, yeah. and that's it. And I'll watch the whole entire thing, and it's like almost zero production. That's and, the talent, man. <laughs> yeah. That's having really, really good talent. And for those of us who are less talented, we need to make, we need to have <laughs> the, <laughs> a lot of people helping us, assistance. I need much, a lot of assistance, a lot of Photoshop. <laughs> yeah. The, the beauty of that, the, about that concept is it's almost the same thing as what we're doing now, but you keep the audience engaged because of the movement yeah. and being in a site, right? Mm-hmm. Like, um, and so here's something for, for you guys, like, um, you know, a lot of architects and landscape architects are getting into storytelling with video. One, it was already time, right? Like it's, it's just a medium that, that is just going to continue getting better, but especially now because of COVID, um, the stuff that we're doing with the podcast and the things I'm learning with filmmaking and the the filmmaking that you guys are learning, you're like, this is a, a very highly billable and desirable skill set that you could offer your clients. Right. So you could do like a post occupancy video walkthrough of your guys's spaces that they could use, um, for their, uh, RFPs for the request for proposals and request for qualifications and they'll pay good money for that, you know, and, um, it's something that's, I think it's going to be, uh, a, a, a really growth industry. Yeah. I mean, no. it, it's not, it's not a suspect. I mean, it's already happening. Like, yeah. yeah. It's, I'm already <clears throat> seeing it. Yeah. You know, I, I agree with that. And it's it's um slightly larger or different topic, but it also gets to 
you know, the fact that that there's a lot of aspects to practicing and having a successful design business that you just don't think of uh, in the beginning, or perhaps when you don't have a business, and that stuff. Um, well, there's a lot of ways that can go, but that stuff also includes um, capturing things after they're done, right? There's a lot of value in having either that skill set, the ability to do it, uh, you know, or having it or whatever else. And, um, you know, it, and, and then also for architects and things, that becomes marketing material. And of it's not course. something yeah. you, a huge part of the effort is all that kind of post, call it post-production, right? Um, things that perhaps people, people don't think about because they... You know, they imagine our practicing to be drawing the buildings, coordinating, getting it done, then that's it. Well, so yeah. there's a back half that actually could be quite powerful. Yeah, also, too, um, I'm a, I mean, I'm a big fan of, of GoPros for capturing video because they, the, with the automatic ISO and the stabilization, it just makes your life so much easier. And they're so, you know, they're pretty cheap, right? Like, they, they are money, but... And, Compared to like my Sony A7, they're almost nothing, right? Oh, that's a nice camera. <laughs> yeah, and um, so I when I when I go film, I, I I have my Sony A7 and I could film, but I still take the the GoPro because it just makes it really nice. And another thing that you could film, which is people love watching, is the construction process. So if you're doing a on-site construction meeting. And you walk through the site and you say, oh, look at the the framing and look at the forms. And, you know, you walk people through a site like that. Like, it's really captivating content. Do you have, um, this is getting into the nerd bit, but the GoPros. Yeah, nerd, that's nerd do, out. Do you, uh, is, is lighting ever an issue with it? Because I always wondered, like, you know, the lenses are so small. How does it deal with Not indoor spaces and things? If you do like this, it has a setting called auto ISO. And then it'll just adjust automatically as you, as you move through the site. I love it. Hmm. <laughs> I just anything that <laughs> makes my life easier. Um, I I, I like. All yeah. right, one more for the list. Yeah, the Christmas, Christmas list is coming. <laughs> you know, the other thing that we were talking about, or you had mentioned uh, before, was kind of the idea of the relationship between architecture and landscape architecture, and it uh, changing in a sense because of COVID. And as you know, we've um, we've actually interviewed the same guest, uh, which is the f the folks from Surface Design, uh, Roderick Wiley and uh, James Lord. James, James Lord, Lord, yeah, mm -hmm. another powerful name. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, so anyway, but you know, so our kind of interest in landscape architects and that community has has grown in the last I don't know whatever three months or what and whatnot. Um, I'm kind of wondering, in the broadest sense, like what. How do you see the relationship between those two? And then more specifically, you had mentioned like COVID has kind of shifted things perhaps. Yeah. So uh, I always love shitting on architects. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's, it's fun to do because we are the, you know, I always call like landscape architects. We're like the, the, the dentists of the, of the field, right? Like, you know, like uh, as far as, I mean, it's shifted dramatically and I'm, and, and I'm being, I'm just having fun, but like I always joke around, like uh, you know, like we have a little chip on our shoulder in regards to like uh, if somebody's like, "There's a is there a doctor in the house? This person's choking." And a dentist comes up and it's like, "I'm a doctor." They're like, "You're not a doctor. Sit down." You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's right. kind of like sometimes we have a chip on our shoulder in regards to not being uh, respected. Uh, mm as like 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 true architects right um and it's something that we have to fight for for uh all the time in meetings and like i said it's changed a lot but there's you still run into holdouts of like old thinking like you know we don't just put plants and make things pretty right like we are real architects with um you know, with a skill set and the same design process and liability is like what you guys have in a lot of cases. So in regards to like what's happening now with COVID is, is a lot of <clears throat> architects are being asked to do uh, roles that are traditionally held for landscape architects, right? Like, like the easiest example is like all of these, um, 
uh, you know, uh, seating areas for restaurants being moved outside, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of architects are being asked to do that. And <clears throat> I, 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 I was asked to review somebody's work, um, some architect's work, and their approach to doing this. And it was, it was horrendous. It was horrible. It was like, you guys are missing really fundamental uh, concepts of what it's like to design in outdoor spaces, right? And we've been exploring and talking about these ideas for, um, you know, for forever, it's as long as the field has been around, right? Like we understand how to work with space and that the, the, the stair tread should not be 12 inches, they should be 14. And um, how to deal with circulation outside and how to deal with lighting and the plants to use and, um, you know, all of those and so much more considerations. I, and, I, um, I, I, I want to interject sorry, real go, quickly. Yeah. Um, I, I know that it's tough to talk about a, a case study or a project on a podcast, but were there specific things about that, that about that particular design that you saw as being an issue? Yeah, sure. Like the specifics would be like way, like way too much hardscape, mm. um, not knowing how and when to use trees for shade. Um, uh, let's see what other issues that they had. Um, I'm trying to visualize the, the plan view in my head. Um, a lot of spatial concerns, a lot of like circulation, mm -hmm. um, and also how it like relates to the street, right? Like right. it being like that close, um, and and um, I guess what what all of this is doing is it's uh, it's like a lot of um, a lot of uh, architects are like, oh, you guys. Are valuable. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> um, did, did you guys ever see the movie Zoolander? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so my favorite scene ever is like, when, um, and I know you're gonna know it already, right? You know which one I'm talking about, right? I, I, well, go for it. <laughs> no, you tell me. Yeah, I think it's the one with the egg. He thinks that the building is too small for yes, kids yeah, yeah, because yeah, exactly. it's a yeah, building yeah, for yeah. ants. <laughs> yeah. So it's, how could you learn how to read if you can't even fit in the building, right? <laughs> and it's like it's so it's as architects like like that's hilarious, right? Because, um, but I posted a meme uh, in my Instagram stories, and um, I was just poking fun of architects. And I, I I took that screenshot, and then I changed the words to saying like, uh, "Oh God, what was it?" I put something in regard like, "Oh, I love how all of a sudden architects are now telling us how to design outdoor spaces," and uh, and um, I just did it in passing and I got so many DMS from landscape architects saying like, this is like an issue now. Hmm. Right. It's like all of a sudden, like architects are being asked to design these outdoor spaces and then we're, like we're in meetings and they're like, Oh, we need to do this. And it's like, oh, actually you guys should be listening to us right now, you know, right. kind of deal. And I know I'm going hard in the paint with, with this or whatever, but, um, no, um, I mean, but, I you know, do, I think it's go ahead. But do you oh, think? Ahead, but do you think the 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 person who actually should understand who should be looking at those spaces is the architect, or is it the client who's asking an architect to look at those spaces? I think the architect should go. Hey, we need to bring on a landscape architect right like, right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. It's almost as if like let's reverse the scenario. Let's say all of a sudden all of outdoors became unsafe. Right. Right, right. Like, let's say, like, some post apocalyptic thing happened and nobody can go outside now. And then our landscape architect clients are like, okay, I need you to design these buildings. And we're like, yeah, I got this, bro. You know? <laughs> and you guys are like, no, you don't. <laughs> this is not how, I mean, you could, like, a lot of skill sets translate over, of course. Sure. But um, that conflict. So I think, I think is uh i think the you know uh and i say this dramatically right just to prove to a to prove a point you know um but like it's all about the coordination working together and bringing on consultants on early 
and uh, to avoid really big mistakes that you, you know, if you're at the tail end of your construction document set and then you bring us on, I mean, there's only so much yeah, we could do, right? Sure. Like, it's like no one's going to pay for you guys to redo a set, and especially if we like point out something really glaringly bad, um, you know, yeah. where the, the, the seismic engineer and the, the civil and structural engineer already all signed off on it's like it's it's too late you know yeah yeah no i i you know starting early um is such a big thing and having the right people from the very like day zero is something that we obviously tell clients for for everyone involved it's like you know yeah you know, like, oh, when do we need an architect? You start start with everybody as soon as possible because yeah. it's there's no harm in it. Um, it's interesting, you know. I think, I I, I think uh, well, obviously there's a range, you know, there's a range of architects, a, rans- a, a range of landscape architects, but in general, you know, some of the things you're mentioning, I can see as being patterns, and I think maybe perhaps partly because in education, the landscape architecture and architecture are are separate a lot of times. And also it goes back to kind of like your, your training as an artist is one that I think is similar to design training in the sense that you're taught like there's a certain there's certain skill sets and way of thinking that get applied to everything you do in life. And that's fantastic for sure. And I think sometimes, you know, architects push the boundaries of that for good reasons. But you also need to realize, certainly in a professional sense, when there's limits to that and when it's, it makes more sense to collaborate together what if there is you know? experts who have a bigger knowledge you know we can make do with the skills we have to do some of you know those types of projects you're describing but ultimately we're not experts of the outdoors and and the streets and and those elements so yeah i mean working hand in hand it, it makes more sense yeah and marina like let's say like like, like you guys are um like a two-person firm right right mm-hmm. So you, you know, I'm going to assume if you're doing a small project, you don't have the budget to hire a landscape architect for the whole entire project. But what you can do is you could say, hey, Michael, we're starting this project. um, And uh, this is our concept. This is our idea. This is the plan view, right? Can you take a look at it? And I say, absolutely. You pay me what, one or two days consulting fees, and I'm able to look at it and right away, I'll be like, okay, let's put this here, let's do this, have you considered this, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and you get that information, it costs you, you know, what, a couple hundred dollars, um, and now you have that much better of a plan. And then you could bring me back on or anybody else on midway, okay, can you t- we take a look at this again? Absolutely. You could take it right out of your design fee. You probably wouldn't even feel it. Or you could just tell the client, like, hey, we have a consultant that just looks at things and helps us out. Um, we want to add that on. Or you could just add it on without telling it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, I know. It's, yeah. it's smart. There's a lot of kind of soft ways, you know, to get yeah. into get into it. Um, I think it's interesting, you know, the understanding of outdoor space I would say for for me personally, it's something I've always been fascinated with from a very early time as as even starting in my undergraduate uh, career. Mm -hmm. And so I've always been very sensitive to it. And it's it's a funny skill. um, It's a funny knowledge to have that uh, some architects do, but others like just don't. Because architecture, as Mm -hmm. you know, is super broad, so you can go this way or that way or whatever. And there are definitely a lot of architects who are hyper focused on like more tectonic things very interior things and um i would i just imagine for me if if i were that type of architect uh which i'm not really but if i were that way i don't see how i would jump to a a very different spatial situation (laughs) and be like yeah i got this you know i I got plants yeah i I understand plants i understand the, the dynamics of this um you know even even with whatever expertise i have of outdoor spaces there's i'm very aware of the limit Right? right, I don't know right. anything about trees. Uh, I'm, in fact, yeah. I'm allergic to all trees, so I, I despise <laughs> them. Uh, so you know, like it's. I guess maybe there's, there's an ego uh, thing involved. I'm not sure. It it can be, but um, now that I've sufficiently shitted on you guys, now I'll, I'll <laughs> praise I'll praise you guys, and that is what I have seen though is the architects that um, do step back 
and start asking questions, right? Like, so when I worked at a multidisciplinary firm, which is, God, I can't say enough, like how valuable that was. Um, and if anyone ever has a chance to work at a multidisciplinary firm, like jump on it. And when I started working with architects and we things were a collaborative and you see some architects really get into it and start asking the right questions like so why did you put this here and why is this right mm -hmm. and then after you see them after a year or something they just become landscape architects right but they're even almost more powerful right because now they have this this whole architecture experience and they're able to apply that using all the principles that we've already established. And I think the crossover architects that become landscape architects are really phenomenal and like mm -hmm. really fantastic, right? Like, so there's the, the good way and the bad way of doing it. And one is just assuming that what we do is easy and you figure it out. Um, and then another way is like, well, let me, let me ask and let me find out why it is that they're, that they're doing. Yeah. And um, some of them are just, just phenomenal like it's it's really impressive to see yeah there's something about the crossover that's that's very powerful that we've seen a uh, that's one of the things that we've kind of realized as a common trait amongst a lot of our very successful guests is that they they're you know they're successful they're known for like one thing right mm -hmm. as an architect or a painter or whatever but they have like this experience that's either all over the map or you know varied at you know in in some way and as soon as they make that jump over to the other side, that's when, you know, the magic starts to happen for them. It's fascinating. I feel like it's yeah. like when you have crossover with like, you know, races and babies, they're always <laughs> so beautiful, you know? I love it's, it. I, I, love it yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the, crossover between podcasts. No, well, okay. that too, it you know, makes the most beautiful right. babies and projects, right? Like, <laughs> no, no, mixed babies are, so I'm Serbian and Romanian and my wife is Filipina and, um, you know, here you um, go. I'm sure your kids are beautiful. Absol yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, of course, I'm biased, but um, I think the, you know, the pretty part definitely comes more from the wife side for sure. Um, but yeah, we, you know, it's, it's funny. I'm glad that you're, um, that's a very French thing to say because like, uh, I think um, in the US, we'd be so scared to say that. Oh, yeah. Because you know, well. you're, you're, you're <laughs> talking about race and stuff but i i like being blunt like that like yeah mixed babies are are gorgeous Mix, and... that's my goal in life is just populate the earth with mixed babies oh, yeah <laughs> good yeah. i'm glad i <laughs> made aware of these plans <laughs> it takes two to have that happen yeah right? yeah, yeah. yeah well it could it could be it more <laughs> it could be yeah why not uh, i think that's a conversation you two need to have on your own um I, but with uh, Go ahead. Go ahead. No. Uh, so, uh, so th this is funny because it's like a crossover episode, right? So um, we're going to be both sharing this content. Um, so I guess I'd like to ask you guys some questions now. I feel like I've been babbling um, away, but some of your guests are, probably already know a lot of this. But for my guests, uh, being the maybe the first time hearing from you guys is, you guys are. Um, you're each other's significant others, correct? Still to this day, yes. <laughs> uh, and um, and uh, also business partners. Yep. And yep. podcast partners. So yep. how did that come about? Where did you guys meet in school or in the field or? Um, so, hm, how 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 much do we want to divulge of the actual truth? Well, let's, <laughs> let's, we let's, let's, let, let's hear Marina because I feel like she's she's that's true. She's, She's oh. more blunt and, and bold. <laughs> this will be interesting for the listeners and myself. Let's go. Uh, we did meet in school. We met mm -hmm. in school at Cal Poly Slow when I was studying abroad for the year. Um, David was the guy who would come in the studio at night, not participate in any studio, and start his day when everybody was leaving. And I was like, who's, yeah. 
who's this weirdo? You know, he's not in the class. Weirdo? You're supposed to say, who's this mysterious hunk? I was very weirdo. intrigued. <laughs> and, 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 he's such, and he's such a geek. He had like three desks and whiteboards <laughs> hanging from the ceiling and, you know, like all kinds of crazy stuff he would make. So I was very, very mm -hmm. intrigued. Um, and he actually made the first move. He invited me and my friend to join him for a road trip that his class was doing uh, down in L.A. to go and see some case study houses. And I I studied abroad with a, two of my very good friends at a time. Mm -hmm. And one of our mission was every time someone would invite us to go and do something or see something, we had to say yes. Oh, we had cool. to like, you know, really like leave the experience abroad as much as we could. Um, so we did it and we went and saw a couple of case studies. And one of the days ended up going at a bar slash live mm -hmm. music place. And uh, he got me a drink and we ended up dancing on the dance floor. The lights turned on and it was just the two of us in the middle of it. And our oh, friends were how like, romantic. what the heck happened? And, um, and I don't remember the rest of the night. So that's... Uh, that's <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> so who's, who's, who's the better dancer? Oh, me for yeah. sure. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I kind of thought oh, yeah. that maybe, but <laughs> it doesn't matter. I think like that's a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, for sure. It's the case study houses, man. We went to see a um, uh, uh, number. Uh, we saw the Eames house. The there's the there's the there's the nerd you were talking about. We just talked this, about this whole beautiful dance story, <laughs> and then David gets right into which the it's case the, study it's house. The case study house. This was seal the deal. Um, you know the Neutral ones, and then case study twenty two, the Pierre Koenig, the sure. the, the super iconic one. I'm never gonna forget that. It was good. Yeah. 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 Because of the people and the architecture. <laughs> yeah. And of course, that marina was there, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a, And I'm just teasing you, David. Um, no, but I'm a pretty horrific dancer. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was pretty embarrassing for me to dance with him. But, you know, I, I had to, uh, I had to help matter. him out. You have to... Um, you dance like nobody's watching. Yeah. That's, 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 that's the key, truly. No. That's, that's the key. People will say that, but you see me dance at home. And would you yeah. say that well, that's the key? No, but at home you're weird. I don't know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, um, so that's great. And then now you guys are in San Francisco and um, your client base is what? Residential and mixed use or? Right. That's a good question, actually. So, um, the the kind of quick backstories that was in in California and then when we both graduated uh, we met back up in uh, sort of met back up in New York City and then we were there mm -hmm. for a number of years uh, doing the New York City life and uh, fairly recently we we came back to California it's been a couple of years now or maybe more and we kind of bounced back and forth between LA and San Francisco so people a lot of times don't know where we are because we're between the two cities. Um, <clears throat> And so with the clients that we cater to are, it's specifically single family residential, high-end custom homes. It's not, uh, we don't do any multifamily stuff at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, although, you know, it, it's funny. We have, I, I would say for the two of us, we kind of think we're very good at thinking short-term and super long-term. Um, and so like our professional experience in New York City covered everything. Like you name mm -hmm. it and we did it. Um, you know, towers, campus plans, art installations, of course, sure. single family interiors. But for the moment, for our practice, it's the single family focus is what we like. Um, and, and so who, like, um, I think every time I, in our pre-meeting, every time I complimented the graphic design, I saw a big smile on Marina's face. So are you the graphic artist in this situation or did i get that wrong it no no i mean it's just we're we're, we're kind of picky with everything we do in this in a yeah. good sense like we we have yeah. very high standards very high expectation we don't get mm -hmm. satisfied very easily with anything mm -hmm. we do uh so when someone acknowledged that it looks good i'm like wow mm -hmm. it was worth all of the hours and efforts yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, and sure. arguments and you know back and forth but typically uh, uh david does a lot of those graphics uh first yeah but a lot of time it, it's kind of a back and forth between the two of us like one comes with the idea the other one takes the next turn and we just keep going until we're done that way yeah. Uh, yeah. we do that on projects and design and it actually always comes out like we're both very very happy with the outcome oh um, good so yeah and then so you guys actually like literally work on the same 
projects together, right? Like like the the construction set and the schematic and design development. Like both of you are involved. Yeah, and I don't. I wouldn't say it's a rare thing, but it's definitely doing a a, a project. Not only having a business together and having a podcast, mm -hmm. but then doing projects together and designing together all the way through, is maybe not super common and not for. Every, not for everybody. Not for everybody. <laughs> yeah, it's not for everybody. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's certainly not easy, and I don't think it's. I don't say that because of the relationship. It's just because we right. make the process hard because we're ultra perfectionists. Sure. Um. Uh. But yeah, we 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 have a good we have a good rhythm that we've mm -hmm. we've found, um, where it's it's a it's a back and forth thing sometimes we're both working the same thing at this at the same time mm -hmm. sometimes we're handing it off uh, sometimes a person's a critic versus being the producer yeah um but it's it's a good pairing in the sense that we both have certain things that we agree on that are fundamental and important which allows it to, to operate but we also disagree on enough things to where you know there's evolution happening um and i and i'm that's that's like uh, that's probably one of, one of the most fun parts is it during design phase uh, for us because of that. So um, I think if you guys have done enough residential projects, if when I say this, you'll probably totally get it. But when you're dealing with single family <laughs> design, you also, as an architect, become a marriage counselor. Hundred oh, yeah. okay. percent. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I think anyone. I've I've never made that analogy and people have not like laugh or nod in, in agreement <laughs> to it. So I guess those who haven't done single family residences, like, you know, you're dealing with you're dealing with people who are investing a really significant portion of their savings and it's a really big deal to them and you have the husband and wife dynamic or husband, husband, wife, wife, whatever um dynamic there is. And I guess what I wanted to know was, do they connect with you a little bit more knowing that you're a couple yourself? Like, I, do you... I, yeah, I think so. I think so. I think it, it helps them, like maybe some of them feel more comfortable with me or with David mm -hmm. or their, you know, the affinities that you develop with your clients and with your architects are, are doubled in our case. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's definitely a big factor. Yeah. Yeah, the, the marriage counselor analogy is super well said and very accurate. And um, people don't, I mean, you know this, but, but you know, clients, they don't realize, especially if there's, this is the first time they're creating a project, like just how many decisions have to be made, right? Oh, God. Thousands, yeah, yeah. like every single thing, especially if you're dealing with a custom home, every single thing, what table, what size, where does it come from, how much does it cost, delivery, and now you have two people trying to make those decisions together and those two people most likely don't have any training in design or an aesthetic kind of eye or vision. Very what are you challenging. Talking about? They have Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's yeah, the the kind of Instagram Pinterest um, reference yeah. is it's certainly can be very powerful but can be yeah. horrific and that's a tough well, one. Yeah. Especially Pinterest cuz it's like you know, they're showing you uh, hundred thousand dollar budget ideas, <laughs> and their budgets, you know, twenty for this for this room, or you know what I mean. And so yeah. it's like, um, no, yeah, I love that that idea of you guys how you work together and how you um push push yourselves. That's 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 a, it. Sounds like a really fun dynamic and i would assume sometimes challenging as well it it yeah especially when you are trying to win the argument you know it's, <laughs> it's difficult <laughs> no but we also have you know somewhat some different interests within the project mm -hmm. so you know if david is feeling very strongly about one part of it well i would let him have it because oh, I'm, it. I'm yeah, you know sure. i'm maybe more interested in like this detail or this part of the project and he he's not so we're very complimentary in on, on many levels sure so maybe like you know david's doing the foyer in the living room and you're doing the master bedroom in the bathrooms or something like that and yeah then, for example yeah yeah, yeah oh, that's interesting and you know obviously because we know each other and we're in the same space we there's no concern 
how do I put this? Like sometimes when you're an employee and you're working in an office or you're an employer, it's tough to to parse things out that way because you end up yeah. getting like different flavors of design from different people, yeah. which makes sense. Sure, but sure. the collaboration is so fluid, it's not a concern for us, you know. Yeah, so yeah. in the end it all gets kind of, you know, pushed through the same uh singular vision, which I think is important because I, it you were going to say something? Yeah, no, that's a very good point. And also, you know, like when clients hire us, they basically have two architects within one, right? They have two designers within one. Like I have my own design skills and and the things I'm interested in developing, David has his. So it's a win-win. Um, yeah, but you should use that as a selling point to double your design fee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that'll fly, but you could try. But 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 that's also something that we're like like David was saying. We're very conscious of making sure it's coherent at the end. Like it doesn't feel like there is two different brains designing the project, but it it makes a consistent story. Yeah, my favorite clients. Or I don't know if you guys have had any clients like this, but the best clients to have is a couple that this is their second or third time building a house. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they've gone through the design process. They know what's expected. They know there's going to be decisions. They're not divorced, so they made it through <laughs> the first one. Yep. Um, yeah, that's yeah. a good, yeah. 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 And when you get those clients, man, things are just like, you know, like they don't they're not surprised about you know uh ad services or things like that like when they just get it oh man it's such a pleasurable experience and um yeah yeah i agree with that and uh they, they, you know they've they've been tested already like you said <laughs> yeah and um it's on you know it's it's tough it's tough and when you're dealing with a new client there's a lot of things you want them to understand um, of how things are going to go and you know i think it's it makes sense for any architecture office or a landscape architecture office to try their best to communicate the steps that are going to happen yeah um and you know it, it it's a, it's a relationship it's a two-way street with uh, the architect and the client and um it's it's not easy sometimes to make sure that the client actually gets what you're saying and they're not just sort of listening and it's kind of going through you know one ear and out the other um yeah but doing things up front can really prevent problems later i was wondering like you know um i mean that happens a lot but like architects and contractors and clients it's kind of like this three-part relationship that's could be very often difficult especially in single family uh, projects i was wondering if this relationship is kind of the same for you guys as landscape architects like you know sometimes here the contractor would kind of play architects or or take over a role that maybe they shouldn't be taking um oh, does absolutely. that happen also in your profession yeah yes yeah I, I before i answer that one thing to keep in mind about doing um about doing landscape architecture for res residential is the biggest the biggest distinguishing, the, the biggest thing that separates our work from your work is that you have to have a home, right? You have to have four walls to keep you protected from the element, the elements, right? Mm -hmm. Like this, this is your shelter, right? right? Nobody has to have a nice backyard. Right. Does that make sense? Right, right, mm -hmm. right. So the difference is, is our work tends to fall into a luxury item right and your work kind of like if you know if anyone's hiring an architect like it's a combination it's 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 a it's a want and a desire yeah but it's also required to survive right yep. so for ours it's it's a luxury item so right off the bat we're dealing with something that you don't necessarily have to have you don't have to have a pool you don't have to have a barbecue, a pizza oven, a gazebo, mm -hmm. uh, all of that stuff. So when the, both the husband and the wife or the wife-wife or husband-husband all have to be on board that this is something that they really want and it's not one per person pressuring the other. Okay, so that's the first thing that we start off at kind of an advantage and disadvantage in regards to like once they're working with us 
um, it's something that they want, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So then, like, now let's get into the relationship with the contractor, like, overstepping his or her boundaries. Um, so it kind of works in two ways. So one, you definitely... Like I have my set of contractors that I love and who understand what I'm doing and they get it and they're not going to override me. Right. Um, but when they hire their own and you're still doing construction observation and I know you guys have experienced this, a contractor kind of pulls the wife to the side and he's like, you yeah. know, I could get this material at $3 a square <laughs> foot. And I got this guy in Sun Valley, right? And uh, if we could just bring it over here, it's going to look the same. Yeah. And, you know, um, when they when they subvert you, that's when it becomes a problem to us. And it happens to us all the time, right? Yeah. Like I'll specify. Let me try to give you an example. Um, uh, let's see. A lot of it has to do with the hardscape side of things. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, cause it, you know, it could be expensive. Um, and they'll try to like lower the material. Like they'll go from like a Ipe wood to, you know, a stained, uh, pine or something like that. Yeah, that's, a, that's a big difference. Yeah, that's, that's a big deal. Right. Cause now you're not just talking about aesthetics. You're talking about integrity. Yeah. Right. And, um, now if they approach me the contractors if the good ones they'll say hey michael um i actually have this product that that i've been using on other sites and it works what do you think and i'll look it up and i'll go great thank you for introducing it to me this saves you money this works the same i don't think it takes away from the design concept go for it right, right. that's when it works out well and it's even smart to do sure sure um but my strategy with contractors is really early on just like i fight for the field of landscape architecture to be brought on really early like i'm a big advocate and a proponent of that um i bring the contractors on early yeah early on if i know that i'm going to use it i ask them questions i listen to their ideas um i make them feel like they're involved uh, which they are right in the design and a lot of times my designs are better because they're the ones building it. They're the ones that are like, look, it's not going to work like this. We need to change this material. Or um, if we make the arbor one foot shorter, then we don't have to cut a thousand pieces because we could just, the, you know, the arbor comes in like the, sorry, the the lengths of wood come yeah. in this size already. Let's just build it at that. And right. it's like, oh yeah, like duh, that's a oversight. Like let's do it that way. Yeah. It's funny to me how just having a simple conversation at the beginning can really determine the trajectory for the whole thing in some cases, mm -hmm. you know? And just being open and being nice and being whatever can just go a really long way. I mean, there are some folks out there that no matter what you do, they're, they're going to be not good to work with, but then they just go on yeah. a list and you don't ever work with them again. I call it, I call it the Karen fee. <laughs> the, Karen, the, Karen fee. <laughs> the Karen fee. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I I don't know if you guys do this, but um, uh, I got called out to do a project in uh, on a hillside, a hillside property, and right away I knew this woman was going to be a nightmare, like yeah. total Karen, <laughs> and I tripled I tripled the design fee. Wow, and three she, times. She, yeah, she never called back, and that's what I wanted. I yeah. was like, right. you know, yeah. I was very polite and stuff. And then when I put together my scope of work proposal, I, th I mean, I came in with like some ridiculous number, <laughs> and because um, she had she had called me and texted me five times before we even had the consultation fee. Yeah, and then and then she said this. This is the kicker. So we were there's two kickers. One of them was. She's like, I would really like to uh, have me and 12 of my girlfriends all be involved in the design process. Oh. 
No. And I was like, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. No, it's not a bridesmaid's uh, party. Like, you yeah, got to yeah, like, yeah, keep yeah, it yeah, down. Yeah. No. I mean, could you imagine the nightmare of that? And then she said, uh, well, we want to do this pool on this hillside, but we don't want to do it permitted. And I was like, lady. Oh, oh man. Red flag. Like, that's a nightmare. Uh, she's like, I think my landscaper can do it. And I was like, yeah, oh. no. So yeah, that's amazing that I mean, what, what, okay. I mean, I don't know what, I mean, this is our industry, so I'm biased and I know it, but yeah, it's, but yeah. still like, how do you think that for any adult that's ever worked in a group, how do you think that having 12 people contribute in a field that they don't know is going to be a good idea? Or even if the field they do know, that's a bad yeah. idea. It's a bad idea. <laughs> it's a bad idea. <laughs> I mean, there was another legitimate uh, scenario that I had that I really wanted. I really wanted this job because it was a historical preservation site and uh, it would have been fun. I don't want to mention the name, but it was very high profile and I was shortlisted to uh, I was shortlisted and you know I had somebody in the inside kind of that would have vouched for me that on the board and when it got closer to putting in my proposal, he was like, yeah, there's nine people on this board uh, that are really passionately involved. And I was like, oh, man, this is going to be rough. And again, I, I think I doubled uh, my design fee on that one, and I didn't get it because I didn't, I didn't want it because yeah. I just knew it's not going to – it's not going to – it's not going to be a pledgeable experience. Um yeah, and you know that's that's one of the big lessons. If if for any practicing designers out there that you learn very quickly is you got to filter out the clients that aren't going to be good, which is yeah. obviously there's there's exceptions you have to make if you have kids to feed and things like this. Sure, sure, but, sure. But you know if you can just uh, avoid it, and you have to know the kind of the kind of client that you're wanting to go for. Like you know with your statement that landscape architecture is different because it falls into a realm of being less needed from a survival standpoint is really important, um, I think, for architects to understand be, for their own profession. Because as you said, architecture falls into this very broad spectrum of, well, I need it. And then also I don't need, you know, really sleek, cool mar marble mm -hmm. and whatever wood fins mm -hmm. and things like this. And, you know, if you're an architect looking for clients, you need to know that there is that spectrum and you need to find a client who's interested in having stuff that is not related to having shelter, right? If you're on that end of the spectrum. And the biggest mistake is that people end up working with a client or a client hires an architect and they misalign on that. The client is thinking more like, I just need someone to stamp drawings or whatever. I need a, more of a shelter kind of situation for permitting and et cetera. And the architect's dreaming of high-end design. And, oh, you know, yeah. they're, they're different, different, different. I'm so glad that you said that <clears throat> because a lot of times uh, as landscape architects, like we, uh, so I'm not, I'm not licensed, but I'll, I'll, I'll collaborate with somebody that is licensed. And oftentimes we're just hired just to like the architects, like almost literally say like to our face, like we don't give a fuck about the design. We just want it to go through permitting, mm -hmm. you know, which is like a really bad way to start, yeah. right? you know? <laughs> But at the same time, nice to meet you too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Have at fun the same designing. Time, yeah. At the same time, it's a little bit refreshing mm. in regards to like, okay, these are my expectations, right? And if you've been out of design school long enough, you're like, okay, I could just get the money on this one. Right. Nobody talks about that because nobody wants to admit like, oh, I'll just do a bread and butter job. But it happens. Of course. And yeah. They, you know, they give you a mixed use plan. They say, just make me past the irrigation and, uh, you know, just make it go smoothly through the city and here's your fee and you move on. And, you know, the way I approach it is I, I, I mean, I'm a designer through and through. I consider myself more of an artist, so I can't help but make it nice. But at the same time, I know I'm just pushing this one through and then focusing more on the clients who really want something spectacular and, and beautiful and kind of knowing your place. And that's that's a hard lesson to learn for young designers that are like, you know, um, like doe eyed and everything is everything is 
uh, a world renowned design, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. I think it's I think it's a very good thing to to highlight and and I think it's fine as long as clients and designers and architects are clear on it as at the mm. beginning, right? I think the problem comes when there is a misunderstanding and people are expecting different things from each other and then there's frustration and then the project didn't turn out the way each other wanted, right? But if you're set on the get-go, you're like, okay, I want something super fancy, super expensive, super high yeah. design, or I just want to get it out of the door, I want to get it built quickly and cheaply, and then, you know, you just, yeah. it's communication. I think that's what it comes down to. I mean, and, and I can I, appreciate, you know, the young designers who, who want to completely redefine the world that you, you don't want to do work like that. And I get it, uh, because yeah. I don't want to do work like that. Right. And it's it's not, I don't think any of us are saying that it's, it's, it's it's what we want to be doing or that it's it's great to be doing it or it's good to be doing it but i think it's more about having just a bigger vision of of understanding of business yeah. like you got to yeah. feed the business to to do great work and whether or not you do that by having a side hustle a different company or you do different kinds of work within your office you know either by typology or by let's say uh, the amount of budget for design mm -hmm. you know whatever but you need to be cognizant of feeding it and that's where a lot of people fall short yeah and you know um a, a lot of it go goes to learning how to turn down work as well yeah, yeah. right like that's yeah. and that's hard to do right when you know when you got kids to feed and mortgage or rent or all of that stuff but at the same time like that's an important skill set to, to learn how it's like you know what? i don't want to do this project and i'm gonna try to hold out um you know or like let's say if you take on a project like begrudgingly right you you it doesn't mean as a designer that you could slack then right sure. you still right. have to give yeah. it your all and you still have to um uphold your like i could tell by you guys you guys are both internally driven right so it's like you know you're gonna do a good job but yeah sometimes just learning to say no it's like i'm not really interested in that job and referring it to somebody else that would be more than happy to yeah. take it yeah, yeah. yeah. right yeah wow yeah, that's a good that's a good way to looking at yeah. it actually um so listen we got to eat some lunch but i would want to <laughs> ask you sure you've got some pretty amazing tattoos going on there um, oh yeah <laughs> uh and marina has some actually pretty cool ones. i have no tattoos uh but um so like what's the story behind the tattoos <laughs> sure so well i didn't know i was going to be an architect so uh, <laughs> me neither <laughs> yeah so i was really worried when i went to architecture school because you know i have my my hands i have very yeah. visible you know um i have very visible tattoos that you can't really hide and uh i was really worried about how that was going to fly in the profession once 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 i decided to to make the move and of course in school it's not a big a big deal or whatever but um you know i get a lot of like it's changed a lot but um but you know 10 years ago or, mm. or 12 years ago there was a lot of concern like people were like wow like you know, is this going to be okay and yeah um so i'll just first approach it from a professional point of view uh and then i'll talk about just what, like why i got them but for in the professional uh i would say that i've pushed it to about the most like my, i have both sleeves and i have my knuckles tattooed and i would say for anybody uh, stay away from the neck and the face tattoos. If you're gonna, <laughs> I was going to say, you're missing you're, the teardrop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to get the Post Malone always uh, tiny. Right. Like, like, um, I would say definitely. I mean, that's I, that probably shouldn't be even need to be said, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it. So stay away from the face and the neck tattoos um, if you want to be an architect. Um, uh, but I will say this that it's actually uh i was really lucky that my i had some really talented friends that were a tattoo artist and a lot of my work is really considered high end right so it's not like the sh like shitty prison tattoos or whatever <laughs> um so a lot of 
a lot of it actually kind of gives me some clout as like the creative. Like, you know, I show up on on site with short sleeves and flip flops. Like I'm known as the guy that comes to meetings and flip flops. And it's like, I kind of like branded it as like, I'm the artist Mm -hmm. type guy and it it works. Um, So for me, I've, I've been able to, to, I've been able to brand it and make it work. And it's funny, like um, sometimes at firms that I worked at when they were doing uh, photo shoots of the projects and I'd be on there uh, on site helping like direct the photographer, they'd be like, oh, hey, can you jump in in the photo shoot? (laughs) Because it's like you look like a like a modern tech guy or whatever, like, you know, or like a creative or something. So in that sense, it works. Um, what was the first one you got? I'm not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't want to say that. Um, second one, then. <laughs> the second one that was the cover up of my first oh, one. <laughs> okay. I'm not even kidding. Like, for real, it's like the first one was a stupid in San Francisco on vacation. And then the second one was a cover up of that. Tattoo. <laughs> um, I'm but not, then no. I. Yeah, I don't have. I, I want to get some architecture. I was thinking of getting a like an XREF error message. <laughs> no, <laughs> I think that would be pretty fun. Um, but yeah, I just don't know. I mean, it's I'm interest. It's sort of interesting for me, but I, you know, just that, gotta go get one. You know, just get warm. Get it warmed up. No, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I don't know what it would be. That's the thing. Yeah. Just pick a random thing. No, I can't do that. I'm not built that way. <laughs> Who cares? You know. <laughs> yeah, I, I tell people because I get I, I it's I get the tattoo question asked a lot, and then I'm like, look, if 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 you don't feel it, don't do it, and yeah. don't let anyone pressure you either. It's like like um, there's something beautiful about um, having I, 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 like like I guess we call it like virgin skin, right? Mm-hmm. And so like my, my wife doesn't have any tattoos and she has like the most beautiful like filipina like olive skin and like the color's perfect and i'm like don't don't <laughs> don't touch it <laughs> <You're good." laughs> you know like like this is this is beautiful on its own um and then of course if you choose to decorate then yeah go for it but um but yeah so david i'll back you up on this one <laughs> Marina, stop pressuring him to get a tattoo. That's fine. That's fine. More tattoos for me then. Exactly. Yeah, cool. yeah. Thanks for listening to this week's episode, and thanks to our guest, Michael. If you like what we're doing, listener, then please support our show by leaving a review in the Apple Podcast app. That's probably the best way to do it. You can also find us on Spotify and YouTube. Most of our interviews are on YouTube as well. Um, you can reach out to us via our own hotline, which is 213-222-6950. You can call, and it will go straight to voicemail. We play the voicemail on the show, or you can text the number if you have any uh, comments or questions or things that we should cover in the show. You can also reach out to us via uh, social media. We are on pretty much all the main platforms of Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And lastly, of course, we have our own website, which is secondstudiopod.com. We appreciate that you're listening. It means a lot to us, and we'll talk to you again next week or sooner. Bye.